Learning and Lifelong Learning Subcommittee. Hello and good afternoon. My name is Jeremy Sia and I am the chairperson for the Active Aging and Lifelong Learning Subcommittee. Today's webinar will be an hour long with 30 minutes for questions and answers. You can type up your questions and you can vote questions that are of great interest to you. The next event is on 4th of November from 4.30 to 6 p.m. The topic is Understanding Breast Cancer Surgery by Dr. Melanie Sear from the Farrell Park Hospital. She specializes in all aspects of breast surgery and breast cancer oncoplastic surgery. Let me introduce our speaker for today. He is Dr. Gopal Singh, a specialist board credited fellowship trained orthopedic surgeon subspecializing in orthopedic oncology, joint replacement, and sports injury. Dr. Singh's clinical practice consists of bone and soft tissue tumors, robotic assisted joint replacement, complex reconstructions of lower limb, and arthroscopic surgeries of the hip and knee, including sports injuries and meniscus or ligament reconstruction. Without much ado, let me hand over to Dr. Singh. Dr. Singh, the floor is yours. Hi, good afternoon. Thank you for the kind words. Um, I think giving this talk brings back very nostalgic memories. I actually am a product of the National University Hospital I'm, and I have worked in NUH. I, after graduating from NUS, uh, I have been in NUH since 2004 until last year. That's a long, that's a long time. And uh, I have very, very fond memories of NUS and NUH. And being in this seat today, um, I am very nostalgic about uh, you know, my recent past. And I still go back as a visiting consultant. I still, go, I still teach. And I think I'm not going to let that go so easily. So uh, yes, without further ado, let's talk about the topic today. Um, so I think without making it too, um, Complicated. Sorry, I can't click. Yeah. So before we go into joint replacement, let's just talk about joint pain. Now, I think I missed the days when I was able to give a physical talk and I'd ask this question, how many people in the audience have had some form of joint pain? When I say, let's talk about back pain, hip pain, knee pain, almost everybody would put up their hand and say, at some point in time, we've had some, some episode of pain. Um, and most of the time, when we are looking at very young patients, say in their 20s and 30s, most of the causes are some form of sports injury. Now, once we get to above 45 to 50 years, some form of wear and tear sets in. And that's going to be the focus of today's talk, how we can you know, live our life to the maximum despite having some of these wear and tear issues. And Last but not least, less common but very serious are issues like infection and tumour, which are making up 5 to 10% of patients who present with uh, bone and joint pain. Now, 5 to 10% in medical terms is quite a significant percentage. And that's because patients with tumours, cancers are living longer due to more advanced treatments and things like that. So we must not... Um, brush these issues aside. These are important issues that we have to be uh, considering when we talk about joint pain. So back to the topic for today, what, what really is arthritis? Arthritis is wear and tear of the cartilage or the lining of the joint. Um, I just want to add a small note here that it should not be confused with osteoporosis, which is the loss of bone mass or hollowing of the bone. Now, most, most, of, most, most of the time, we can treat arthritis without surgery. A lot of people think that I'm walking around with a knife in my hand and I'm going to chop people up the moment they walk into the door in the clinic. And that's not true. 80% of the patients in my clinic are non-surgical. That means we are not doing surgery for them. 
Now, there are a lot of other modalities like physiotherapy. Now, physiotherapy, again, a lot of people think it's just some general uh, modality where we get a bit of massage and a bit of, you know, strengthening of the muscles. Physiotherapy is much more than that. It's, 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 a, it's an art and a science that is, if done in a very targeted fashion, the results are amazing. Now, I always say that the patient is... I always tell patients, you are your best physiotherapist. So you need to do this these exercises daily and as often as possible. Now, if these are done regularly and you are focused on, say, strengthening one particular group of muscles that you know you work with your physiotherapist and your doctor, you will be surprised at the results. Now, medication, mostly painkillers, anti-inflammatories, walking aids, Modification of exercise, simple things like if somebody is running, uh, you know, he, can, he cuts down on jogging a little bit, but instead replace that with a bit of swimming or cross trainer type of activities. The, even those things are activity modifications. It's not about, okay, you stop exercising and from now on, you're just going to sit down on a chair and no, no walking. It's not as drastic as that. Injections. Injections are of two basic kinds. We have the steroid-based injections. We have the gel-based injections, and they have a role as well. So in combination, I always tell the patients, it's every, every patient is different. It's the, the modern medicine is about tailor-making or customizing treatment. Everybody's needs are different. So whether it's non-surgical modalities of treatment or whether it's surgical modalities, that means we some form of operation, there is no one size fits all. Everybody is different, and the whole, whole point about an exercise of going to your doctor is to have that, to have that tailor-made treatment plan for yourself. And that's, the whole, that's where modern medicine is moving towards. Now, about 20% of patients in my practice with advanced arthritis usually require joint replacement surgery. And once again, it's a tailor-made approach. So I'll take you through that. And just to... Just to um, just share what is knee replacement. If you look at the top picture, um, that's an early arthritis. If you look at this, this is the worn out part. The rest of the joint is okay. So we just replace that part of the knee and you realize the rest of the joint is untouched. Now this is a one day hospital stay with modern robotic techniques. And um, I'll try and show you a video later if it works of how the patients are doing. Now, the picture at the bottom here shows advanced arthritis. Unfortunately, a lot of patients, I wish they would come with early arthritis like the picture above, but a lot of times in our setting, we wait until the, the car breaks down and needs to, we need a tow truck to be brought to hospital. So that's, this is the, the, uh, the, the, the situation in which we are dealing with most of the time. And in this case, we need what is called a total knee replacement. Uh, which is shown in the x-ray. And again, we have robotic techniques to do that, which make the surgery smaller, more pain-free, more bloodless, and a shorter hospital stay with faster recovery, longer lasting implants. Now, hip replacement is another, is another um, common, commonly done surgery with, with very, very good results. And the challenge with hip replacement is getting the position of the implants right. And when I say getting it right, it's getting it right to the, to the degree, not guesstimating, not estimating. Now that technology again helps us in this area. And once we get the, the implant placement very accurate, the longevity or the lifespan of the implant logically would increase. So let's um, talk a little bit about new technologies in joint replacement. Now, I think rather than say new technologies in joint replacement, let's put this in context. We have a lot of patients now who are younger, who are more active, who are coming and saying, look, I want to have my quality of life. Let me, let me give you, I'll give you some real life examples in a short while. But just last week, uh, or two weeks ago, sorry, I've done a knee replacement for a gentleman who is 52 years old. And he's an avid cyclist. He cycles 100 kilometers a week. And his knee is, one of the knees was completely, completely arthritic. Um, so he tells me, look, do something. But I'm going back to cycling 100 kilometers a week. So I'm like, okay. 
So I have to then tailor make a strategy for him. I have to use all the technologies available to me, the best implants, and make a, give him a customized solution that will allow him to go back to cycling 100 kilometers a week. Um, so this is the kind of situations we are dealing with more and more. So new technologies in the field of joint replacement can be, I just attempted to sort of come up with some form of uh, classification or, or, or scope, so to speak, so that it makes discussion easier. Now we have, but in reality, it's not just one of these things, it's usually a combination. So 3D printing is something that is often talked about. I think, again, the, the concept or the common theme here is customized surgery, tailor-made surgery, tailor-made treatment, not just surgery, treatment. Customized implants, okay, we, we, we cannot, it's diff the difference is, for example, if we go to a department store and we buy a dress um, or a shirt, now if you're in between sizes, what do you do? You either have to accept something which is a bit too loose or something which is a bit too tight. And it's not ideal either way. Now, surgery is quite similar. If we are in between sizes, what do we do? So in the past, we were dealing with some of these problems. But today, with modern technology, I think we are lucky enough that we can swing the pendulum towards customized surgery, customized treatment. Now, computer navigation has actually taken we have gone beyond computer navigation, so we won't talk too much about computer navigation. We are now talking about robotic assisted surgery, which is way ahead of computer navigation. I'll take you through robotic, assistance, uh, robotic assisted surgery in, a, in the next few slides. Infection control. Whenever we do a joint replacement, the biggest fear of the orthopedic surgeon is infection. We say that we have about a 1% risk of, of, of infection um, with modern techniques, modern day operating theaters, but we can never get that to be zero. We can get it to be less than 1%, but it's never zero. So we are always trying new ways and means to bring the infection risk lower. Now, why are we so scared of infection? Because if we get an infection with a piece of metal inside, then we have to then do a surgery to remove the metal because antibiotics do not penetrate the, the area so well. Um, the, the bacteria tend to stick to these metallic surfaces and form like a resistant film called biofilm and antibiotics can't penetrate. So it's, it's a real nightmare for lack of better words for the surgeon as well as the patient, of course. Um, it is something we all are very fearful of. So we try everything possible from scare tactics to asking patients don't have visitors in this COVID context um, you know, that's something that has automatically happened um, to all kinds of things we do, like, well, you know, in the operating room, I'll just show you a slide in a minute. New materials. Um, I happen to be part of a work group that uh, with, with the uh, Germans, you know, we have, uh, we, we are working on new materials. The key question is, can we come up with a new material or that implant that lasts the lifetime of the patient? So far, we have not been successful, but we're pushing the boundaries every day. And of course, robotic assisted surgery. Now, if we, if we marry all of these technologies together and we come up with, 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 the, with the base or the foundation being good surgical skill and expertise, then we can push the boundaries of joint replacement. We can push the boundaries of implant longevity and lifespan of implant. So let's just take a quick look at this slide. This is a slide of uh, a picture of an operating room. Um, I won't, I, if, I'll give you a prize for guessing where I am, but um, unfortunately, uh, the prize is not very attractive. Um, uh, if, you, if this was a physical talk, uh, then we would uh, have a quiz. But the, what I'm trying to say is that even I can't recognize which one of them is me. The reason for that is the space suits that we are wearing. Now this, when we do joint replacement surgery, we do more than wear the usual masks and, and hoods. We are wearing the spacesuits with an internal ventilation system, which completely eradicates any, uh, you know, secretion or bacteria from the surgeon falling on the on the surgical field. 
The other thing you would notice is that there are only three people here, inclusive. One of them is my assistant. Actually, there are four people. One of them is the anesthetist behind the screen. I would have given another prize for someone spotting the anesthetist. Um, the scrub nurse, notice she's double gloving. And double gloving is another technique we use. Um, the, the, so we, we do not allow uh, people to walk in and out of the operating room. The doors are closed. There are minimal staff in the operating room because humans naturally bring germs. We have these space suits. We've got something called laminar airflow, which is basically uh, airflow that avoids um, you know, turbulent air currents in the, in the operating room. So, and cleansing solutions are you know, special cleansing solutions, pre-clean. We do not shave the patient a day in advance. We, sh we shave right, right before the, op you know, the operation starts. Antibiotics are given within a one hour time so that during the point of skin incision, the antibiotic levels in the blood are at the highest. You know, you know even the light handles are special. We do not keep adjusting the light handles. We have, the lights are such that we don't need to keep adjusting them. So there are all these, um, techniques that we are, we are using to minimize, um, you know, uh, ventilate, I mean, uh, uh, infection. So if you, if any of you need a joint replacement, please ask your surgeon, what are the, te what are the techniques or what are the measures being taken to, to, to make sure that my infection risk is at the lowest? Of course, patient factors contribute. If you have poorly controlled diabetes, then you should not be going for this surgery until your diabetes is controlled, for example. And this is just a slide to show, um, you know, um, the, the group I was talking about. I work with these guys. Um, uh, unfortunately, some of this work has come to a small, uh, you know, uh, a halt because of COVID. But we are now working on Zoom and 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 satellite. But um, pre-COVID, uh, four times a year, I was with this group in in Germany, and they, I mean, a couple of times, they, uh, you know, the representatives would be in Singapore. And this is our group that uh, works on. We have material scientists. We have engineers, we have doctors, and all of us have one common objective. Can we come up with that implant that lasts the patient's lifetime? Um, and we are all very driven by this objective. So uh, hopefully we can come up with that implant during this lifetime of mine and ours during this career. And it, it would be the most rewarding experience for, for myself. Now, this is something that I talked about earlier, 3D printing and custom-made implants. Now, this is an animation which shows that if we have a complex defect in the pelvis that needs a, a complex hip replacement, we can, you, with the aid of CT scans, teleconferencing with engineers, we can come up with a custom-made implant or a 3D printed implant for that patient. Um, this is possible and it has been done. We do it. And now for robotic assisted surgery, which is possibly the main um, highlight of today's talk, because this is something real, we're doing it. And Farrah Park has the facility to offer this technology for all patients. So what is robotic assisted surgery? Let, let me just speak about robotic assisted hip replacement. Again, this, is, this brings back very nostalgic um, memories. Um, I, I led the team to do a first robotic assisted hip replacement in Singapore in 2016. And uh, at that point, um, I'll, I'll just share a story with, which, uh, you, know, you know, surgeons being surgeons, we all tend to have a very big ego. We think we are the best. And, you know, when I was doing the surgery, I was thinking to myself, those are the numbers, uh, and this is not that case, but these are the numbers that you see on the screen below. We, this is special. We only see this when we have robotic assistance. Now, if you look at the screen, this 42, 38, 19, 20, these are the, this is what I, 38 is what I, for example, if I've planned 38, and now the real time angle that I have when I'm operating is 42, this is what the screen will show me. And beyond a certain allowance, the machine will stop me. It's like an invisible wall that I have. So when I first did this surgery, I thought, you know, when I put in the cup as I, as, or the, the socket, as I always do, as I always would for any other hip replacement, I thought I was right. I thought I had it right. And it has been a humbling experience because the machine will just automatically swing your arm towards 
what the right angle is. And as I said, you know, surgeons being surgeons, we, we, we tend to have big egos. I mean, I speak for, I'm not speaking for many of the surgeons out there, but you know, these are common jokes that we have about surgeons. So, so oh, you know, how can, I be, how can I be wrong? How can this robot be right? And true enough, the robot was right. And this happened for many, many cases. And I was completely, completely humble. Whatever ego I had was shattered. And I was thinking to myself, this is just amazing. With this technology, I can see the post-operative x-ray of my patient even before I touch the patient. And I get the same x-ray every time. It's not because of my skill. It's because the machine or the technology makes it reproducible. Now, I'll just, I'll just do a small exercise, which I normally do in physical talks. See if, if you can see that. Now, this is my mobile phone. Now, if I were to ask you what is 40 degrees with regards to the horizontal, some people would do this, some people would do this, some people would do that. And this is what I'm trying to illustrate is exactly what we face in hip replacement. We have to adjust the cup 40 degrees with regards to the vertical, sometimes 38 degrees, sometimes 42 degrees. Then we have to swing it 20 degrees forward. This is how we need to put the socket in. Now, how are we going to get that right? It's almost like saying, you know, for a paratrooper, if you want to jump, you know, and you want to land with your parachute on X marks the spot, how are you going to do that? So, of course, those guys are trained. They can do it. But think about it. If all of you have a mobile phone, take out the mobile phone, put it on a flat surface, and tell me what's 40 degrees. Now I want you to swing 10, 10 or maybe 20 degrees forward in that 40 degree position, every one of us is going to have a different position for that 40 degrees plus 20 degrees, the two vectors I've asked you to do. And this is what's been happening. So we have been doing surgery with a concept of zones of safety. That means if I get it between about 35 to 45 degrees, I'm okay because this is the best surgeons in the world have been polled the alignments of the implants have been taken and it's a bell curve. It's a bell curve because as human beings, we can never be that accurate to that degree. And this is where we need to recognize that surgical skills, surgical expertise is important. You cannot substitute surgical expertise, but you can now push the boundary. You can, I'm still opening the hip the same way. I'm still doing the same surgery. But now I have my friend who is this makoplasty robot here. Now with this robot, when I am putting in the, the, the socket, the cup, I've already, I've already done a CT scan prior to surgery and the CT scan has been loaded into the robot. And now I know if I want 42 degrees, I get 42 degrees within plus minus two degrees. I will, it, it's, it's going to be accurate. It's not a guesstimation exercise anymore. So we are progressing. We are breaking through leaps and bounds in terms of surgical skill. When we marry surgical skill with technology, the results are amazing. Of course, we have to understand that machines can fail. So we must be very good in terms of doing conventional surgery before we adopt technologies like that. that, that this is the reason we cannot replace surgical expertise and skill. So in my experience, Robotics, the, what robotics has done for me, it has, it has sharpened my skill. It has validated my outcomes. It has made me a better surgeon. Or sometimes I joke, it has made me an orthopedic technician now because the, the, surgeon is, seems, the surgeon is the robot. I have been demoted. So I'm most of the time, I'm like, okay, you know, soon if we, if we are not careful, probably won't have a job because this robot might be doing everything. So, but I think jokes, jokes aside, we need to embrace technology. If you need a hip replacement or a knee replacement, ask your surgeon, what's the role of technology? Can robotics be used in my case? Will it help me? Now, in some cases, there, it may not be a huge difference, but if you have complex anatomy, if it is, if it is a very arthritic or deformed joint, yes, it will be a big difference. So let's take some examples. Let's just pay attention to the age. These are real case examples. 52 year old, left hip pain and stiffness, difficulty walking, difficulty with shoes and socks. And this shows on, the, the, the problem is on the left side. Now, 
It's a mirror image because the X-ray is taken from the front. And this is the problem. It's an arthritic hip with a condition called acetabular dysplasia, which means the patient was born with a shallow socket and 52 years old. So arthritic, disabled. And so we did a hip replacement with robotic assistance. And we have been able to reproduce the, the relationships in terms of length. And patient is back to doing everything except deep squatting. Again, 52 year old. I intentionally chose the young, younger patients because in the past, when I was training, if I had, if we ever mentioned to our teachers that a 52 year old, I would do a joint replacement, we would get hit on the knuckles. That's how it, it was. It was almost criminal to talk about a, hip, a joint replacement when I was in my training days for a young patient because implants were not lasting very long. If you do it in a young patient, you're almost guaranteed that you'll have a revision surgery very soon. But now the pendulum is changing. Patients are coming to you and saying, I do something. I want to live my life. I I'm, will cross the bridge when it comes to it. Implants are better. Technologies are there. So we're pushing the envelope. Let's take a look at this case. 52 year old, active patient, frequent traveler, history of a road traffic accident 15 years ago. And let's look at the hip now. This hip is completely arthritic because of a previous fracture. And patient is now disabled with this pain. So again, did a hip replacement, patient's back to traveling, back to doing everything, back to even light sports. Now the question is, if you put that hip through to this new joint replacement, through such active activity, then will the joint wear out faster? The answer is yes, but here, this is not a metallic head anymore. This is a fourth generation ceramic head. What you've got here is now a highly cross-linked polyethylene liner. Okay, and this is an uncemented stem done with robotic assistance now. So hopefully we've pushed the boundary. How many years? We don't know. Time will tell. Hopefully 25, hopefully 30, hopefully the lifetime of the patient. Yeah, so it's hard for me to say this because the data is going to... Time will tell when these patients now hit that 20 year follow up, 25 year follow up, um, maybe when I'm close to retiring, uh, maybe when I'm passing on the beta to my junior colleagues, then these follow ups will be there. And then we will know for sure. If this hip is still going strong by then, then we have achieved it. Yeah. So that's. Okay, this is a bit easier to recognize here um, because the, the nurse has taken the photo from this side. That's my fellow, he is now in the United Kingdom. And uh, this is me doing a partial knee replacement. Now, what you see on the screen here, it's almost like playing a computer game now. Everything is on the screen. And we do not even use saws, we use like dental burrs. For those of us who've had a dental filling, that's the kind of instruments we use for this case. And what you're gonna see here is exactly what happens during the surgery. This is an intraoperative clip. So pardon the noise. Yeah, yeah, that's exactly what you see. And you see, this is the, you can see the numbers as you move, pay attention to these numbers here. This is the native deformity of the patient. Sorry, let's go back. Let's look at the numbers. Oh, I'm sorry, can we, uh... yeah. So I know exactly how much I need to correct because there's no guesstimation anymore. And this is the post-operative x-ray. Um, we have a short video, but unfortunately the video is not working on the screen. So I'll have to disrupt this and share the video with you. Okay, and that's him at one week. Let's pay the patient's at one week. I, in the past, we could never achieve, um, you know, this, this level of, yeah, let's, let's go back to, yeah. So that's at one week. So I think that's something that um, I, I really can't give myself credit for that because I wouldn't have been able to do this without robotics. Now, I just want to remember when we first had that slide on, we talked about not all joint pains are due to wear and tear. A small minority are due to more serious causes such as infection and tumor. And the proportion of these patients are increasing. So in general, if you have pain at night, if pain wakes you up from sleep, if you have rest pain, if your pain does not correlate very well with activity, or if you have a recent history of cancer, then um, it, 
you need to get checked. So these are some of the, 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 the main things, but if in doubt, we should always get checked. So I just want to share a story of a gentleman who has been a big inspiration to me uh, and many, many, uh, many patients I've treated. So this is a 70-year-old gentleman and uh, he, he, was, he was an avid golfer. So he, play, he developed left thigh pain after missing a step. And the pain persisted, got worse, until he was on a wheelchair. And he had a history of kidney cancer five years before. Five years before is a reasonably long time. The kidney had been removed and he was told that the cancer is cured, which, I mean, in all fairness, once we hit five years and you're disease free for five years, we kind of say, yes, that's, that's a cure. Now, what happened then was, now he has no more kidney left and he's functioning on one kidney. And this was his x-ray. What this x-ray shows is that this area of, of the hip, the wall of the socket is completely eaten up. But compared to this side, the lines are all missing. So what that shows is something is going on here that's eating up the hip. So what we did was we did a needle biopsy of this area. And the needle biopsy showed kidney cancer. Now the kidney is miles above. It's, if I were to draw, the kidney is way above here. And the kidney is gone. He's functioning on the other kidney. So some of these cancer cells somehow stayed around in the body, in the bloodstream or wherever they were hiding. Five years later, deposited themselves on the bone here and ate up literally all his, all his wall of the pelvis here. And if he had continued to walk on this, this would have broken through right here. And all of this is tumor. So um, this gentleman came to me and he said, I, I want to play golf. So I was joking with him and I said, you know, I, I had actually treated him with um, one of his relatives, sorry. And that's why he came to me. And so I, I said, maybe it's a better idea to watch golf on TV now, because I think we, we you know, they said, no, uh, you made my relative walk, you make me walk. And I said, I was honestly not very confident of that, but we said, okay, let's give it a try. And this is possibly the most complex hip replacement that one can, you know, the, 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 this side is the same, but this side, we have removed the tumor. We have reconstructed the wall with, with, a, with a donor allograft bone from a donor, like literally a bone transplant sort of situation. And then we've put a cage on top of it with these screws to protect that area. And then we've done a hip replacement on top of that. And I, that's him. I have a video for this, but for, for technical reasons, the video is not working. Um, but at three weeks, he walks into the clinic. It's an unplanned follow-up because he was in hospital for another reason. And this was him at three weeks. I wasn't smiling like this when I, when I, uh, saw, uh, when I saw his, uh, when he walked in like that, I was um, rather upset, as you can imagine. And I quickly sat him down. And then he told me, I'm just here to say hi to you. And I said, you almost gave me a heart attack because I told you to walk with crutches and not let your crutches go. Don't put weight on this. I was not so confident of my own surgery. And he was, he taught me a lot. This patient has been an inspiration for me. Then he said, Hey doc, let me tell you something else. You want to have, you want to take a sip of water before I'm going to give you another heart attack. I've already played nine hole golf. And I was like, <laughs> you're joking. And then, but he, what he taught me was the power of motivation, how, how strong willed he was. He wanted to walk. He believed in the surgery and he did it. I, as a surgeon, did not have that confidence in that surgery I had done. I was worried that he might put weight on it, the surgery might fall apart, the hip might fall apart because it was a very complex surgery. And I was very humbled again by this experience. And this gentleman went on to, to live um, another four or five years, he, he did. And then the disease spread to his lungs and he has passed on since. He has been an inspiration to many patients. His family is in touch with me and I have consent from the family to share the story. Uh, and I often do so at many of my talks. And I often remind myself of him and how positive his outlook towards life was. So with that, 
um, I would say thank you. And I hope that I've yeah, put some of these uh, problems of arthritis, joint pains, and new technologies that we have to treat joint pains and arthritis in context. Um, I'm happy to take any questions. And with that, thank you. All right. Okay. Thank you very much, Dr. Singh. Um, thank you. Thank you. Okay. We have uh, uh, two questions here right now. The first question is, what is the service life of hip replacement? What happens after the service life? Okay. Um, so generally speaking, this is, this is something that has been evolving. Now, if the same question was asked, in the late in the 90s, for example, we say about maybe about everyone would say about 10 years, 15 years. Now we say 15 to 20 years. It's a bell curve, but with these technologies that we have, we we are we think we are pushing the boundary to well beyond 30 years. And I I cannot quant qualify myself with evidence from the literature or because. We will only know when, as I said, when these patients now live to that point where there's, there's a follow-up of 30 years or longer. We hope that we are achieving lifetime, uh, you know, service life, so to speak. But the honest truth is that we are not there yet. But we hope that with all of these technologies and newer materials that we have, we are going to try and push the boundaries. The, 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 there's a very nice um, way in which one of my teachers and mentors has put this. He told me, he said, the factory or the man above, as we would like to call it, when he designed the body, his blueprint has been amazing. We as orthopedic surgeons, material scientists, and whatever you call it, we are trying to copy or to get that design. The hip replacement is trying to imitate the native hip joint, but we are not successful in imitating what nature has given us. Now, the day we crack this code, yes, we will last a lifetime, but we're not there yet. And we are trying our best with science and materials and things like that. But yes, I think I'd, I'd like to believe that we are pushing the boundaries well beyond 30 years now, hopefully. And hopefully this question will get answered in my career. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Dr. Singh. The next question we have here from the participants are, what are the current alternatives? No, no, sorry. Researchers find method to regrow cartridge in the joints. What do you think of this? Yes, thank you for this question. I think, um, you know, stem cells, regrowing cartilage, I think this is a big, big, big area of research. And I mean, coming from NUH, NUS, I personally have been exposed to a lot of this uh, research and I've been part of, you know, we sit down, have coffee with the, 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 main, the main guys who are doing all of this stuff. And I think there's a lot of promise, a lot of promise. But when we're looking at advanced arthritis, we, this is not a solution. Advanced arthritis means that we have lost all the cartilage with deformity in the joint. So we'll look, this is a very promising modality that's coming up in very early sort of wear and tear. So what, what it brings us now towards is, again, a mindset change. We need to, to, to be seeking help at a very early stage. We, we are, if we wait until advanced arthritis sets in, then even whatever, whatever promise these newer modalities like regrowing cartilage do bring or will bring in the near future um, won't be very applicable in advanced arthritis. So I think um, while the research advances, hopefully we get some good solutions soon. Right now, a lot of things in this area are still experimental. But I think a lot of it is showing promise. But we also have to seek treatment early. And then, you know, potentially we can get some benefit from that. Yeah, thank you. Okay, thank you very much. The next question we have 
for you, Dr. Singh, is what can we do to prevent knee and hip problems? I problem? think there's one question before that. What are the current alternatives for severe ankle OA? Okay. Um, so again, this in questions like this, it's always, I can only give a very general answer um, because, like I said, medicine is taking a very tailor-made, customized approach. For questions like this, it's always best to get a consult with your surgeon or your doctor. Um, the, in general, the treatment options are the same. They're, if it ranges from conservative to surgery, and the surgical options for severe ankle osteoarthritis are either a fusion or a replacement. Yeah, thank you. Okay. Right. So, next question is, what can we do to prevent knee and hip? Uh, so, again, this is a very broad question. Um, it's, uh, the answer is, I mean, this is a very broad question. So, in general, I think uh, maintaining a good body weight, having a good diet, a, a reasonable balance of exercise um, is, is important. I always tell patients that, I mean, it's again a very tailor-made strategy. We, in, my, in my approach would be that at first assess the patient and see where do you stand? I mean, are you already having some degree of arthritis? Then we need to slow you down. And we need to look at your individual activities that you do and tailor make a, stra tailor make a strategy for you. Uh, it's a team approach. I usually work with a physiotherapist, sometimes even a personal trainer. If there are any like torn meniscus uh, problems that need to be fixed in the knee, we do that first. If you're very advanced, then we do a joint replacement and then rehabilitate you. So I think it's a very individual situation, but in general, Maintenance of a healthy body weight, good diet, adequate calcium, vitamin D in your diet, um, exercise, a balance of aerobic activity. I was, anything you do in the pool, you know, in swimming, whether swimming or even walking around in a pool of water, that's really good for your joints. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. How can we make an appointment to consult with you? By email? Yeah. I think we yeah. can send that. Uh, we can send that. Uh, yeah. yeah. Your uh, contacts directly sure. to the participant. Yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah. Okay. Next question. I had a ACL operation in 1971. Now wow. I often feel some pain okay. during exercises on my knee around the cartridge that was removed. Is partial replacement a solution? I am 70 years old but very sp sportive and healthy. No cancer, no other illnesses. First of all, hats off to you, sir. Mr. YP Kong, hats off to you. Um, I, I, I hope that at some day I can say the same that you are saying, that when I'm 72, if I live to 72, I can say this statement. It's, that's amazing. This, just, this makes, for, for an orthopedic surgeon like me, hearing that makes my day. Um, I think this is... What, again, it's very hard to answer this in a general way. Uh, I would need to examine the knee and have at least a simple x-ray uh, to see whether is partial replacement the solution or maybe you don't need any replacement at all. So uh, without a physical examination and an x-ray, it's a bit difficult for me to answer that. But from what you're telling me, I think you have a good knee and... I congratulate you on that, on whatever you've done to maintain that knee, despite having an ACL operation. And I think you are a role model for everyone around here. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Dr. Singh. Um, the next question we have here is, um, who are involved in the design and making of the shape of the implant, and how long does it take? Thank you for this. Um, I, so we work closely with industry partners. Um, the big players in Singapore are Stryker, Zimmer, DPU, Johnson & Johnson, Smith & Nephew, uh, just to name a few. Um, HSA is very, very strict on the implants we have. So a lot of these are either uh, European or American companies. Uh, the designers of the implants, are, they are always engineers, material scientists, and surgeons working as a team. And the manufacturing process, 
Um, I'm not sure of the exact figures, how long it takes, because I'm not, um, I'm not an engineer or a material scientist, but I'll just share with you anecdotally what my experience has been working with the German uh, engineers and material scientists, because I'm involved in some of this myself. Uh, my specific interests are, what about the patient with metal allergy? How, for example, um, when you look at the cosmetic industry, if ladies have allergy to some, you know, you have allergy-free lipsticks. Why, what about joint replacement? What if there are patients with metal allergies, allergy to nickel, aller when you wear a watch, you get a rash. When you wear earrings, you get a rash. What, when, you get, when you have arthritis, then how do you, what do you do? So we are, I'm working with the Germans answering some of these questions. How long can, the, can, I, can we have the implant that lasts the patient's lifetime? We're talking about ceramic coated implants, treatment of surfaces to make it more like ceramics because ceramics have a very low wear rate. So this kind of stuff is all going on. Um, so I think, again, to answer this in detail, would, you know, I'd love to have a coffee with um, the person who's asking this question. But um, it wouldn't be fair for me to just throw numbers in the air because um, this is a very, uh, you know, this, this, we have to take it in the context. And then I can take you through, like, for the, for the tibial tray, for the femoral component, for the polyethylene insert, you know, what are the processes involved and that kind of stuff. I mean, I'm not an engineer, but I could just share a working knowledge with you. Um, you feel free to email me and we can, I'd love to discuss this question because that's my interest. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Singh. The next question we have here is, um, what can one do to prevent loss of cartridge? Thank you, sir. Um, thank you, Mary. Uh, I think this is again, this is a fantastic question because it, it, it's, it's basically asking, basically what, what Miss Mary is asking is, what, how, what, how can we prevent arthritis? The honest truth is that some loss of cartilage will happen to all of us. Um, but why do some people have more loss of cartilage? Why do some people have more severe arthritis? Again, we, there are some factors which we think we know, some factors which we think we don't. Like body weight, uh, what's the role of if obesity has been linked to more severe arthritis. But I think in general, again, um, we need to see where do you stand. The first thing to do is to have a clinical examination with your doctor, have a standing x-ray. Sometimes we, we do an MRI. And then we're not answering this question in a general way. We, 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 let's, let's figure out where your start point is to asking this question. Now, if you have, let's say, early arthritis, then the goal is to prevent more severe arthritis from setting in. If you have zero arthritis, if all your cartilage is intact, then we, don't, then we want to prevent any loss at all. So we can then tailor make a, a, a regime of activities. Um, for example, if you have arthritis in the front of the knee, or the kneecap, then I always tell patients, don't do leg press, don't do cycling so much, maybe a bit more swimming, maybe a bit more brisk walking, jogging, cross trainer. So we're actually going into the nitty gritties and the details. So in general, um, healthy diet, maintenance of good weight, a balance of activities, and knowing where you are in terms of your individual situation really helps. I hope I've Helped, that it helped you answer in some way. But again, feel free to email me or give me a call. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Singh. The next question we have is, what are the signs of advanced arthritis? Yeah. So, advanced arthritis, generally the signs are um, increasing pain uh, related to activity. You need increasing need of painkillers, uh, stiffness of the joint, uh, reduced movement, stiffness, uh, deformity. Sometimes you may feel like you may look at your legs and say, I got bow legs or knock, knock knees, so to speak. Um, yeah, so these are some of the signs of advanced arthritis um, where it's not just bone on bone, but in addition to that, you develop a deformity and stiffness of the joint because the muscles around it also become stiff. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Singh. The next, the next question we have from the participant is this. 
I just had a meniscus surgery with micro fracture. I am on a walking frame. Doctor told me not to put more than 50% body weight on my treated knee. I feel I can walk without the walking frame. Should I do that? Um, thank you for this question, uh, Mr. Wilfred. I think, um, as I said, uh, all, all is, first of all, it's good that you can feel that you walk without the walking frame. I think that your doctor has done an excellent job. Um, and I think it also tells me that you're very motivated with your rehab. Um, but I would suggest that you, you ask this question to your own surgeon because um, it's, it's, it would not be fair for me to generalize and give you an answer. Uh, everybody is different. It depends on the size of your cartilage ulcer. It depends on the, the condition of your knee. And if your doctor has asked you to protect uh, in terms of body weight, he may be um, allowing that ulcer or the lesion to heal. And he, during the healing process, he may not want too much weight on it. So I, I, I humbly suggest that you should ask your uh, surgeon about that because he or she will be able to answer this better than I can because I can only give general type of answers in this context. Thank you. Okay, thank you. The next, the next one we have is, um, a surgeon told me that after my knee joint replacement, I would I would be able to go jogging. This I find not logical as the lifespan of the replacement is like 15 to 20 years. Isn't jogging would increase wearing off faster? I'm delaying my ops until after age 65 so as not to get another ops if I were to live longer than 80. What's your opinion? Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for this question. I think it's a very, this is a very relevant question and this was really the focus of today's talk. So, um, I, in, in the past, I, I fully agree with you that um, jogging technically and theoretically does increase wear because it, it's impact. It's impacting the joint surfaces. And this has always been traditional thinking that we should delay the surgery until 60 or 65 or longer so that uh, you don't need a revision surgery in your lifetime. However, um, because of advances in technology, advances in materials, we are allowing, and of course, younger patients, as I, meant, as I gave an example of a patient who was doing 100 kilometer cycling a week, I did a knee replacement and he's gonna go back to that. Uh, we, we, uh, sort of accepting that younger, more active patients are going to need joint replacements because they are they're putting quality of life ahead of the statistical probability of living that long. So because of the quality of life, if they do the joint replacement, um, generally we would advise that maybe like activities like deep squats, um, Jogging, if it's on a treadmill or uh, soft ground, sometimes I even I tend to allow that depending on what implant, what kind of implant I have done, whether I have used new technologies, how confident I am with my knee replacement. And, but I do tell, I have a discussion with the patient that we're, on the one hand, we're doing this because we, I want to let you go back to your activities. But on the other hand, as you correctly said, this will theoretically wear out your joint faster. So you need to understand that by doing that, you might actually end up going down that path. I, I wouldn't know for sure because we've done all the new, new technology, new materials and all that kind of stuff. So theoretically, you can. Uh, but I always say be cautious about it. Do it maybe on a treadmill. And I always try to swing them towards doing a cross trainer or a, or a bit of stationary bike or maybe swimming if they, and most of my patients do agree with that. So I managed to get around it. But yes, I have a number of patients who, um, like I did, a, my youngest knee replacement is on my own nurse. Um, she's, she was 40, 43. And uh, it was because of an accident she had in her younger days. She's jogging, she's doing everything. but. The implants I used were different implants. They were, I mean, 
we we brought in, like I said, it's a customized approach. So new technology implants that are sort of meant to, you know, withstand more stresses. It has to be a discussion you have with your surgeon. Think of the knee joint replacement as a customized approach for yourself. You need to tell your surgeon, this is what I want to do. And your surgeon needs to tell you, is it okay for you to do all of this or not? And then you have to come to some kind of you know, agreement before you go into the surgery. I, I hope I've made sense. Thank you. Happy to take this on a personal note. I'm happy to uh, give me a call or drop me an email. I'm happy to discuss this with you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Singh. Um, this question is, is walking helpful to those with degenerative knee joint? Thank you. I think walking is generally helpful for everything. I mean, I always say don't let your joints get rusty. The only problem is that when the degeneration or the arthritis gets to a point where, you know, walking itself becomes painful, then you get all kinds of other things setting in weight gain, inability to exercise, and then your heart becomes weaker, diabetes becomes worse, and it's a vicious cycle. So the answer, the short answer is yes. I would advise you to, I would encourage you to continue walking as much as possible. But because I don't know your exact situation, if it's if it, the situation is that walking itself is becoming painful, then I think it's time to get a checkup. Yeah. Thank okay. you. Thank you. The next question is, whatever you presented today, does it apply to bunion problems? So thank you for this question. I, I think bunions are a separate discussion. Some basic principles do apply, um, but I would, I would discuss that separately. I mean, the considerations are quite different. Yeah. But we, I mean, hopefully we can arrange uh, another session or I could, I'll take this on offline. Um, I'm happy to dis discuss this offline, um, but the discussion is a bit different. I don't think um, we can apply um, in a blanket way what, what I've discussed, uh, presented today to a Banyan issue. The considerations are a little bit different. Yeah, thank you. All right, thank you. The next question we have from the participants is, my knee pain was diagnosed, non-reversible degenerative problem, was prescribed painkiller. I did not want to take painkiller. Instead, I sleep with leg warmer over my both leg knees to keep them warm. Since then, I did not have any knee pain for many months now. What is your comment of this simple remedy? Thank, thank you for this question, Judy. I think that, first of all, thank you for sharing your simple, your, I don't think it's a simple remedy. I think it's a very well thought of remedy that you have um, used. And since it's worked so well for you, thank you for sharing it with us. Um, I think this is, it is, it's very common that we hear um, that in the cold weather, the, jo the joint pain becomes worse. Um, there is definitely some basis to this. So what I what I what I think is probably what has what when you when you keep your when you keep the area warm, you probably have increased in some way the blood circulation, and you know you've you've had some therapeutic effect. I'll, I'll just give you an example. Um, you know, after a long day surgery, I sometimes feel that I, you know because I sometimes end up I'm a bit tall, so I end up bending and doing it, and I have neck pain. So I go back home and I put a hot pack before, before I sleep for half an hour, a hot water bottle, and I feel really good about it. So I think there is some basis to this. And uh, I, for one, never brush aside these things because I think, um, you know, science and technology has its place and uh, home remedies as well have their place. And I think uh, if you have swelling, you generally use ice and cold packs. But when you have pain, I mean, very often, it is soothing when you have something warm. And if your, if your pain is gone, I, well, congratulations to that. And I hope you stay pain-free. And I will share this with my patients, if you don't mind. Um, maybe a lot of people will benefit from this. So thank you very much again. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Singh. Next question we have here is, do you think taking supplement will help with maintaining cartridge in the joints? So this is a very commonly asked question. And I think, um, again, this is a long discussion. It's a whole talk by itself. But 
we must be we must um, you know be be a little bit cautious about supplements. While while it's first thing to understand is that um, in in the Singapore context, um, most of us do not. Uh, we're not really in a situation where we have severe nutritional deficiencies in our diet. So normally supplements would be, so, so we, we as doctors need to assess our patients from that angle. I mean, when I'm seeing a patient uh, and they ask for supplements, the first thing I ask myself is, what's the likelihood of, I, I go into the diet and I ask very specific questions to assess whether, um, is there a possibility of some kind of deficiency for example, if someone is eating just plain bread every day, then clearly there might be some deficiencies. Then the, the, the thing is then to adjust the diet or, or to take some supplements. Now, I, I think you're specifically getting at what's the role of things like glucosamine and things like that. Um, the, the, there is some, I must say the evidence is rather weak and we are, in the Singapore context, I see a lot of, glucosamine being used. I personally, when we patients, a lot of patients ask for it. So we generally do give, um, but I'm a little bit cautious about it because there is some new evidence coming out that in, in animal models uh, and even in some patient data with, for those with established diabetes, um, there were some reports of glucosamine worsening sugar control. So I think, I think we must all be a little bit judicious with our use of supplements. Um, it's not, I mean, it is, it's okay to take supplements for cartilage. I generally do recommend taking vitamin D because I think a lot of the population is deficient on vitamin D, especially now with the, after the circuit breaker and all that. But vitamin D is something I always recommend. But um, cartilage supplements, collagen, uh, glucosamine, um, I think that, that we must try to differentiate between the commercial um, advertisements and the true, the true scientific evidence. So yeah, sometimes it's not that easy to tease this out. So yeah, thank you. Thank you. The next question we have here is this. What are the causes of bone nakedness in older people? Is bone nakedness preventable and we saw, how do we do that? Yes, so the commonest cause of bow-leggedness in older people is severe arthritis of the knees. And um, it's, it usually needs to be treated. Hopefully, what, what the, the purpose of these kind of outreach talks is that, um, you know, when, when, I, when, I go to one of, when I go to a hawker center, for example, I often see a food courts um, some of you know our older generation uh, with severe bow leggedness walking and struggling and it's very painful for, for me as an orthopedic surgeon to see that because um, you know I know that can be fixed and if that's not sorted out then uh, the person might be on a wheelchair in time to come so I think bow leggedness there are many causes but the commonest one in older people is due to severe knee arthritis and the best prevention is to get your arthritis treated. Um, so see your, see your doctor and uh, get an X-ray of the knees, get a physical examination and work out your options. Um, don't, don't continue living with it because um, at some point when the deformity becomes a lot, the results of surgery are also not as good. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Singh. Um, Next question we have here for you is, is knee pain related to our spine? Uh, yes and no. Um, knee pain per se uh, could be due to knee, knee, a problem in the knee itself, like a meniscus tear, arthritis, ligament tears. It could also be related to the spine because the nerves to the knee area are all coming from the spine and the knee is usually L3. So when you have a nerve pinch higher up in your spine, you may also feel the, knee, the pain around the knee. L45 is usually more at the back of the knee. Um, you know, so again, um, if you have wear and tear or arthritis, sometimes it's not just one joint. So it, this is a question best answered 
by a, a detailed clinical examination where it's one of the, it's an everyday thing that I do when I see a patient, I'm trying to decide whether the pain is coming only from the knee or is it an element of spine or you know a nerve pinch element which is associated with it. Um, it's a bit difficult to answer this question over um, you know, a webinar like that. It's best to uh, discuss that you know, with your doctor. Okay. The next question we have here for you, Dr. Singh, is this. Are joint noises without pain a sign of arthritis? If not, what causes the noise? Thank you for this question. Um, joint noises, or what we call crepitus, is generally um, it's, it may be the ends of bones rubbing against each other. It also may be sometimes a friction due to muscle uh, snapping, uh, uh, rubbing across a bone. Um, it's, you, if it is pain-free, uh, generally we are not um, very worried. But if it is associated with pain, then uh, we definitely need to get evaluated. Um, once again, uh, you know, in, this has to be taken in the specific context um, of the patient. So uh, in the specific context of the patient, if there are other medical problems, um, then that has to be, it, it, you have to evaluate in that context. Uh, per se, if it's joint noises without any pain, no other medical problems, your life is no deformity, you're very active, then usually uh, it may be a sign of early arthritis, but uh, certainly we wouldn't do surgery just for, this, for you know, joint noises and things like that. We would normally be very hesitant to operate and offer surgery. Yeah. Okay, thank you, Dr. Singh. Um, we have another supplement question. Um, does taking calcium supplements help with backache? Um, okay, so there is no direct link with calcium supplements and backache, but um, what, you, what we need to understand is that I think the context in which this is being asked is probably osteoporosis, and osteoporosis is a topic for another day. I touched on it very briefly because osteoporosis means that the bone mass or bone becomes, bone becomes more hollow uh, because of the reduction in bone mass. So um, calcium and vitamin D, vitamin D being important, very important in the calcium homeostasis of the body is these are generally, we, we all prescribe them uh, in an effort to prevent or to slow down osteoporosis. And especially if the individual is vitamin D deficient, then uh, which a lot of people in Singapore are, um, because we all probably don't get enough sunlight. Um, I think in that case, vitamin D and calcium definitely benefit. But it's not that taking calcium prevents or helps with backache. It does not cause an effect relationship. The idea is to prevent or slow down osteoporosis. If osteoporosis is not tackled properly or prevented, then one can get osteoporotic compression fractures of the spine and other problems that then contribute to severe backache. Yeah, thank hey. you. Thank you, Dr. Singh. We have another question here. I used to have knee pain and I had doctor's suggestion I go for knee replacement. Fortunately, one surgeon took x-ray of my left hip and we realized the problem is my hip, not knee. I had the hip replacement done. The knee doesn't hurt anymore after my hip replacement. Is it possible to misdiagnose? Thank you. Thank you for this question. Um, again, it's, it would be, it, I'm not really in a good situation to, to, because I don't know the details of the case. Um, I, what I can say is that there is, um, a, there is overlap in the nerve supply between the hip and the knee. And a hip problem can present as knee pain. In fact, we often ask this in our postgraduate exams, where we present a situation to the trainee where um, you know, the problem is in the hip, but the pain is felt in the knee. 
So that scenario is certainly possible. I, I would not use the word misdiagnosis as I do not know the case, but um, having a problem in the hip and feeling the pain in the knee is a common and uh, a, a real scenario. Maybe I shouldn't use the word common, but a real scenario. And in this situation, um, it would not be fair for me to comment unless I know the details. And then, um, you know, we can have a more detailed discussion. But I'm happy that it has all worked out for you. And um, from that angle, I, I, I wish you the best. And I'm very happy that this is, I mean, the treatment has been in the right direction and everything has gone well. So thank you. Thank you. Right. Um, questions coming in. Gen general question. What are you... What are your suggest, just suggested ways to keep one's knees healthy? Again, uh, this just a maintenance of a uh, healthy body weight, um, a, a mix of different types of exercises and activities. Uh, for example, uh, cycling and leg press type of activities, which involve uh, this movement a lot, will take a toll on the front of the knee. Um, whereas jogging, brisk walking is more on the the you know the the the, the tibiofemoral compartment we call it the bottom of the knee so to speak um, swimming is a really good exercise or even walking in the pool because it offloads gravity so i think uh, it's what i would suggest is if you can have a mix of activities good diet um, maintenance of healthy body weight and at some point advice on a more personal level from say a physiotherapist, personal trainer, or a doctor um, who can advise you on what are the, if you could, where do you stand in terms of your, do you have arthritis, do you have early arthritis, do you have some wear and tear, and then sort of tailor make or customize a strategy for you. The, the, key, in, the key in today's day and age is to customize the strategy. It's not enough to have a general strategy for everyone because everybody is standing on a different point and what works is a tailor-made strategy in my humble opinion yeah. thank you okay thank you will taking calcium regularly help with osteoporosis thank you um i think we've addressed this question in one of the questions above so um maybe i'll just go through it briefly um the body has a very tight maintenance of calcium levels in the blood. So uh, if, if one is calcium deficient, yes, then it will, uh, but it should be taken with vitamin D. Overdoing the calcium also causes problems and can get kidney stones and things like that. So again, um, osteoporosis is a condition that should be managed with your doctor and calcium prescriptions and vitamin D prescriptions should be taken in conjunction with your doctor's advice. Um, we've done, done some of, we've dealt with this in an earlier question just now. So perhaps I'll, in the interest of time, I'll move on. So thank you. Yeah. Well, we have one last question for you uh, before we wrap it up. Yeah. Uh, is cycling good for knees? I just took up cycling so with my kids. So, uh, you know, this is putting me in a bit of a, a spot. But uh, so any form of exercise, okay, cycling is a good exercise for cardio, cardio workout. Um, it, if you overdo it, it's going to wear out the front of your knee, um, what we call the patellofemoral compartment. But the same with running, if you overdo it, it's going to wear out the tibiofemoral compartment. So it's a, it's a, we, we as orthopedic surgeons often have friendly discussions and debates with our cardiology colleagues because all these exercises are very, very good and healthy for your heart. But they do wear out your joint in some way. So I think, again, cycling in general is a good exercise. I have to say that because I've just taken it up myself, and I know of many doctor friends who do it. But what I would suggest is, again, on a very personal, it's a very personal approach. If you have some wear and tear in the front of the knee, then I would say, okay, I won't say stop cycling, but then I would nudge you or steer you towards more of jogging, swimming, cross trainers, that kind of stuff. But if, you have, if your knees are healthy, then yeah, it's good. 
there's nothing it's it's so I, again it's a very individual approach yeah and how much you do right thank you dr singh um so thank you dr singh for sharing your deep domain knowledge with us thank you very uh, much thank you participants for tuning into this webinar if you have quite more questions um, that you want to contact Dr. Singh, please send an email to Jocelyn of NUSS, and she will be able, she will be happy to share with you uh, the contact numbers and email of Dr. Singh. Thank you, everybody, for you. for today's uh, webinar, and have a great evening. Thank you, everybody. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye bye.